Hey, chiropractic students and recent grads, how successful could you be if you had a resource that clarified your vision, helped you develop a plan, saved you money, time, and heartache, shortened your learning curve, and helped set you on a course to become profitable your first few months after opening? The Cairo Planner is here. More than just a journal, it's a guide to creating and launching your chiropractic practice in 100 days. It's jam-packed with tools, tips, ideas, action steps, resources, and inspiring quotes from some of the top chiropractors and business leaders today. Think of it as your own personal mentor, inspiring you, answering your questions, helping you set goals, and advising you on the many unknowns of opening a practice. Go to chiroplanner.com today to order your copy. Hey there, my friend, this is Dr. Richard Day, and you have found the Cairo Business Mojo Podcast. We've got a good one for you today. Now, have you ever looked at doing house calls? Have you ever thought, how can I reduce my monthly overhead, get rid of this lease payment that I'm making, having to deal with all of these employees that I'm paying their salary, really decrease my stress? Um, maybe this is something for you. Now, maybe it's something for you if you're just graduating and looking for a very low-cost startup opportunity. Consider becoming a house call doctor. I mean, this is like the good old days, right, when doctors used to go and make actual house calls. So it's an opportunity to serve your avatar, your ideal patient, uh, right in their homes or in their workplace. And you can go in and you can see an entire family um, or 10, 12 people. If you stop by the office uh, every you know two weeks or every month or something like that, um, now you've got to be willing to travel. But, you know, that can be a tax write off. There is a whole lot of benefits to this. Remember, this is a low overhead opportunity. And recently, Dr. Haley sat down with Dr. Lucas Marchand. He's a house call chiropractor in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. He got his degree in biology from Wayne State College, and then he went on to attend chiropractic school at Northwestern Health Sciences University in Bloomington, Minnesota. He shares a lot of great information with you, and Haley asked some great questions too, so I know you will enjoy this episode. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Marshan, for being with us today. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. Good. So thank you for accepting my request to be on the, the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in your Facebook group, and so I'm very intrigued by everything you have going on, and I'm excited to dig in. Perfect. Let's do it. Okay. So can you start by telling us a little bit about why you became a chiropractor? You know, I didn't have the uh, um, the awesome story that I heard with a lot of my classmates where they had like some you know, miracle, you know, healing with chiropractic, or I didn't have a family of chiropractors, um, you know, that I kind of went off of. I, um, I went in, you know, kind of pre-med, you know, like a lot of kids do. And, uh, about my sophomore year, I really got into just like, like alternative health, I guess. Uh, I was really into nutrition and exercise and all that stuff. And I had a couple of friends that were interested in going to Cairo school. So I shadowed some of the clinics that were in the area. And I mean, I completely switched from going, you know, potentially the, the med school route to going into chiropractic. And then I played college football. So I did have, I guess, a few injuries and I went to, um, you know, the chiropractor for that. Um, but that's really how I got into it. It wasn't like a, a crazy story. I just thought it was something cool and I knew I wanted to be in the healthcare. And I felt like chiropractic would be a good fit for me, especially if I wanted to, if I had entrepreneurial aspirations. Cool. Yeah. I, you know, when I was a little kid, I wanted to be a doctor until I got a shot and I thought, I can't yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, you know, I went long, a long time before I decided, Hey, I can kind of do this without doing that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what were your plans after graduation? Were you going to be an associate or, or what, what did you do? Uh, so I did, I was an associate. I specifically, I was very tactical coming out of school. Um, obviously I practiced very different than how I associated. I, I specifically wanted to learn how to run a business and cause I didn't, you know, you don't get much of that in school. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, so my goals were when I w was doing my T10 internship and then my associate, I specifically vetted clinics that were under some form of practice management, um, they're seeing a high volume of people, more than 300 mm -hmm. people a week. 
Um, not that I practice that way, obviously with house calls. Um, and then that I had an opportunity to learn the marketing and maybe build my own practice and assist that clinic so I could learn the skill set. Um, so I associated right out of school down in Texas and it was a very busy clinic. It was about, they were seeing about five or 600 people a week between two docs. Um, oh, wow. and, uh, and I learned a lot. Um, definitely not for me. I think I was, uh, I was a bit naive going in there. I was all excited, ready to get started. But, um, so yeah, that's what I, I started out right out of grad school. Okay. And how long did you do that for? I did that for a year from, so I graduated in 2000, the fall of 2014. And then 2015, I was licensed and I could work at the clinic. I just couldn't treat or do any more. I was basically just doing x-rays and you know, that stuff. Um, and then, so I got licensed in 2015 and then I spent a year there. And then after that, I moved back home to South Dakota and started my, my house call practice. And it wasn't really, I wasn't planning on the big move and starting a practice. So that's why I started house calls, to be honest. Okay. It was just kind of a way to break into the scene. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, in 2015, my, uh, my dad passed away and, uh, mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so I decided I needed to move back and be closer to my, my mom and my sisters. And I knew at that, after having an experience as an associate, I didn't, which wasn't that great. Um, uh, I learned a lot there. I mean, there was a six month honeymoon phase where I really, you mm-hmm. know, I, I took it all in. Um, but it just wasn't for me. And I knew that I didn't want to associate it again. And I was probably going to stick around Sioux Falls for a while and I didn't want to have to deal with any sort of non-competes. So I, I just was like, all right, I'm just going to start my own. Um, I'm not going to take out a business loan because we have plenty of student loan debt. Uh-huh. And, um, and I'm not sure, you know, if I'm going to be successful as a, a business owner, so I'll just kind of go off my savings. So I figured all I need is my hands and a table and something to do notes with. And that's really about it. And that's kind of how I got into house calls. I think that's great. I, you know, the first question I have for someone when they come to me and they want to be an associate is, well, do you plan on being in that area? Because if you do, you need to consider the non-compete aspect of it. Yep. So yep. cool. So do you have anyone that works with you? Nope. I'm a, calls? I'm okay. a solo, solopreneur right now. Okay. Well, I'm really interested in this because there's a lot of aspects that I think someone with a brick and mortar office may not think of when they, you know, you go start to do house calls. Yep. So do you use an EHR? I don't. I started out using that because I didn't know any better. I, so I uh-huh. started out with, with a free one. Um, and, uh, and now they're not free anymore. I think they charge quite a bit more. And for what they offered, I decided um, I, if I was going to pay for that much a month for their EHR, I wanted more. Um, so what I did is I spoke with a couple like, HIPAA compliance officers and, uh, mm-hmm. and I kind of went paperless basically. So I basically, what I do is I, um, I will, or paperless, EHR list. And I, um, I'll scan basic intake forms into a file onto my computer that I do when I do these house calls. And then I basically uh-huh. have a running word document, which is like a travel card for that person with, you know, their chief complaint and the date and then my soap. And then I sign it with an electronic signature and I back all that up to an external hard drive. It's all dual encrypted. And uh, uh-huh. so I don't, even, I don't even have an EHR right now. It's, I really, I keep my overhead really low. And at this point it's kind of like almost sometimes it's a little ridiculous uh, because <laughs> I mean, I'm doing, I've been doing this for a while. I probably can afford to, uh, you know, invest in some services, but I like to keep it pretty low. So, yeah. Uh huh. You know, when we opened, uh, overhead was really big for us. We wanted to keep it as minimal as possible so that so that we weren't having to work extra to pay for the overhead. Yep. And yep. we we started um, using by using files too. We didn't yep. have any HR, so I think it's a really good way to start. Yep. So then, do you do you bill insurance? I don't bill any insurance. Um, it's all, you know, just straight out of pocket. And um, okay. I've even moved away from doing the uh, super bill. It gets, gets annoying. Um, uh-huh. um, and I actually don't have too many people asking if they could have a receipt or if they could bill their insurance. So um, so I haven't can really. You, 
Do you oh, know if someone wanted to? If Can you be in Medicare and be a house call chiropractor? Uh, I think you can. Um, I okay. When I got out of school, I, you know, I, once I was getting my NPI and uh, with, with this associate clinic and I was um, mm-hmm. going through the process of getting, you know, going through Medicare and get, starting the insurance process, I just decided I didn't want to do insurance in the future. And I knew I wasn't going to be an associate forever and I wanted to be all cash or whatever. And uh, so I didn't even finish the register registering with Medicare. So I legally cannot see a Medicare patient. Um, yeah. So, um, but Medicare, from what I understand with some of the people in our group, um, I think it's been fine. I think they do see, you know, a Medicare population via house calls. Um, okay. And I, I think it's, I think it's fine, but you know, I don't do that. So I'm not sure a hundred percent. Yeah. That. Okay. And now is tax time. What, what are some of the major tax benefits of being a house call chiropractor? Can you deduct your car? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can, you can deduct mileage. I do mileage. You can, there's probably two different ways you can do it. You can um, deduct, you know, just expenses and gas and costs, but uh-huh. the my, the mileage deduction is really good. Um, because yeah. it's like, I think that it's like 55 cents a mile or something like that. They comp you on and that accounts for any vehicle maintenance and insurance and you know, yeah. all that stuff. And it keeps it pretty simple. So, um, so you don't have a, a ton to keep track of. You just keep track of, you know, if you're using the vehicle out for personal use, then you have to keep track of at the beginning of the year, what it started at and then Mm -hmm. keep track of how many miles you put on via doing house calls or traveling for, you know, marketing or continuing ad or something like that. And then just figure out the difference. Okay. So you save a bunch on overhead. Is there anything that becomes more expensive? I guess gas, but you get to tax deduct that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I can't any, think of anything any where. What's that? Any draw? Any drawbacks that you can think of? I don't think so because um, you know, at first, when you have your overhead as low as possible, I mean, even even embarrassingly low, like me, uh, um, it gives you time to figure out the market and what you need to do, um, mm-hmm. and uh, and now I've you know built up you know. Um, the practice where now I take a lot of that money that I was just saving because I, I'm, I'm very conservative. I, I save a lot of my money. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and now I'm just taking that money and I'm starting to invest it. And I hired a Facebook guy to uh, help me out with Facebook advertising. And uh, mm-hmm. I feel like I know I'm, I'm pretty read up on that stuff, but it's better just to outsource it to someone that that's what they do. And then I don't have to worry about Facebook. I'm just being a chiropractor. And mm-hmm. if that, and it's been really successful so far, I've only been doing it a month and it's been really good. Um, and if that keeps going the way it's going, then I'll take that money and put it into Google ads. And if that goes good, then we'll put it into something else. And so now I feel like, you know, three years into it now, I'm starting to like, starting to thrive a bit more. Uh, the first uh-huh. year I was kind of in that survival mode. Just, I just didn't want to be that statistic that failed. Um, uh-huh. uh, so now I'm starting to, invest more into the practice. Um, and they say, you know, in a business, you know, 10% of your revenue should go into marketing, but with house calls, I mean, you really don't have any too much overhead, generally speaking. Um, Mm -hmm. so you could probably push that a little more. Um, and so I'm going to start doing that this year or I have been doing that this year. So, yeah. I like that. You said it takes a couple of years to get traction, right? Yeah, I feel like I we talk. My husband works at the school, and we talk to a lot of students. And I think there's this impression that some people just jump off right off the bat. And I think yeah. that more commonly it takes a couple of years to really to feel like you're you're in a groove, and you start spending more money on yeah. things you need and things that'll kind of keep propelling you forward. Yep. So yeah, I, I mean, it's it's tough to. Uh... That's one thing I would tell like younger people watching this in school is, um, you know, social media can be kind of, you can learn a lot. I mean, we have this Facebook group and mm-hmm. a bunch of other groups that you can, you know, get advice from, you know, more seasoned docs. Uh, but at the same time you're on Facebook and you see some of your classmates and it looks like they're really killing it. You know, they had a beautiful new clinic. They just graduated, you know, um, it looks like there's helping a ton of people and then they're doing well financially, but you know, you don't know the whole story and, but it yeah. can be, de- it can be depressing kind of just seeing that and looking at your own practice and like, man, 
Um, yeah. <laughs> so. Well, you just have to remember it's a highlight reel. You yeah. Know, anyone? Why would you post anything else on yep. for everyone to see? Yeah. So, so why why do people most why do most people seek you out? for the house call chiropractic. So when I started and I still do this, um, you know, I learned a lot about marketing when I was in that uh, high volume practice down in Texas. Um, we did a lot of mm-hmm. spinal screenings, which I don't, I don't personally really care to do, but you know, if you like doing it, you know, that's good for you or in massage events. And, um, and I'm just not, I just not good at that stuff. It was easy when I didn't know anybody in that community and I could go out and just, you know, do a spinal mm-hmm. screening and I didn't care who saw me cause I didn't know anyone, but this is my community this is my hometown. People know who I am and I don't want to like, I don't know, tarnish my reputation by kind of, for me putting myself out there like that and kind mm-hmm. of being like that. So what I did was I, I did, you know, external marketing, but I was just available Saturdays and Sundays and into the evenings during the week. And Honestly, people are just Googling chiropractors open now or chiropractors near me. And mm-hmm. I mean, I was getting, you know, tons of people on the weekend because no one's open on the weekend here. And that's kind of really how I started building it. Um, so at first, that's how they sought me out was um, I was just available. And then now, I mean, I have a pretty big wellness base now. And it doesn't take a lot of volume to fill your practice in with wellness patients when you're doing house calls. Um and uh, so now it's a lot of retention for me, but also I'm getting, you know, new ones now from Facebook. And since I started doing that, I think, to be honest, I'm still even doing this for three years now. I'm still in that relatively obscure, you know, you know, people telling me, like, I didn't even know this existed. Um, so it's not like I'm ubiqu- ubiquitous in my market yet. Um, I'm just comfortable right now. So I just want to keep pushing it. So people will seek me out because of convenience. Um uh, my availability. Um, and I'm, I'm surprisingly, I don't really have super high fees. Uh, so I'm relatively affordable. So that, that combination, um, I think that's why people seek me out. So do you have an avatar or kind of, we call it the ideal patient avatar? Yep. Yep. It's kind of, it's kind of changed. I thought when I started out, it was going to be, I was going to market to professionals, you know, like lawyers Mm -hmm. and entrepreneurs and, and whatnot. And uh, what I found was, is I was just kind of, it's kind of the idea. It's like, okay, build something and see who likes it, I guess. And for some Mm -hmm. reason, um, you know, my, yeah. And like, (laughs) and like, for some reason, like my, I keep the stats on this, like the average person that calls me is, you know, under 30, um, just under 30, they're about 30 years old and it's 50, 50 male, female, um, probably making less than $60,000 a year. Um, you know, it's not these high end, you know, lawyers and doctors and professionals. Mm -hmm. Um, it's very, you know, normal people. Uh, and, and they, that's like my base right there. So Uh my, I guess my avatar now is that, and I kind of market towards them. I was talking to the other day to someone about car wraps and we were talking about avatars and who your market is. And, you know, when I started out and I was trying to, if I was going to market to professionals, yeah, then I would get a nicer, you know, like a, a Range Rover or a Mercedes or something, you know, and that's, yeah. you know, maybe, maybe even unmarked vehicle, but because my, my, um, you know, patient base is, you know, just regular blue collar folks, they wouldn't, they wouldn't mind if I had like a big pickup with a car wrap on it or something like that. It just depends uh-huh. on who your demographic is. And it, mine tends to be that latter group. So. Wow. And it probably depends on your area too. I mean, are there yep. a lot of, are you in a, like in an urban area? Are you where there would be a lot of attorneys and. Yeah. I mean, Sioux Falls is decent sized. Um, okay. Sioux Falls is about, I think it's about 195,000, the town itself. And then, Mm -hmm. um, and then you had some of the surrounding towns. So it probably gets to about 220,000 and it grows about 3% a year. It's growing really fast right now. Um, you know, there's two major medical hospitals here. Um, Citibank headquarters are here. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of job opportunities here. Um, and there's a lot of chiropractors here because, um, insurance is reimbursements are really good here. 
So I, I mean, it's funny that I don't take insurance because of that, but like, um, yeah. so yeah, no, it's, it, it, it's a pretty, the way I describe Sioux Falls is it's, there's a lot of people that come in from the surrounding small towns and they move into the quote big city of Sioux Falls. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, so it's a, it's, it's an amalgam of a bunch of people from small towns. And I think that attitude is, you know, what consists of Sioux Falls. So it's kind of blue collar yeah. attitude for sure. It's a big population though. Okay. Well, I was intrigued by a post you made on Facebook that you saw 30 patients one day. I did. Half of of which were small businesses. So how did you make that connection to the small business? Because that's probably really good for you. You only have to go to one place, see many people. Yeah, that's I mean, that's the ideal setup. Uh Uh-huh. So I connected with with them was through um, either I was seeing one of their employees as a house call patient and I just say that you know um hey I can treat you at your work as long as it's okay with your you know your HR and your you know boss and all that stuff and then another one the big one was I treated like an executive at this company at, on a Sunday they're having a bad headache and uh-huh. it just randomly called me and I happened to be open goes back to being available and uh-huh. uh and uh and that's how they started that out and now I'm like there once once a month or so for like, you know, they had me out there and, and the first time I did it, it was tough because it was all new patients. So uh-huh. I mean, it's a little more of a process there. I'm not doing a nine, nine, two Oh three on everyone. You know, it's very focused. Um, but now when I go there, it's, I know all these people and it's, you know, most of them are just wellness type of people. They just want to get adjusted. They don't really mm-hmm. have any primary concerns. If they do, we can set up a house call later. Um, and, and that's how I made that connection. So a lot of, I haven't really specifically marketed to com- companies. Um, okay. It's just, it's just word of mouth through other companies. And, and when I did start out, I was doing like chair massages at companies. Um, I don't do those as much anymore. Um, mm-hmm. Just sends the wrong message. I don't do massage. So, yeah. um, but I found that it could, that could be a good way to now I think about it, leverage, maybe, okay, I'm doing a massage here. We could easily just set up a table and, you know, do it in this dentist office. Cause a lot of the companies I work with are, you know, they're under 50 people, you know, small, Mm -hmm. you know, contracting companies and dentist offices and, you know, little banks, stuff like that. So I think dentists would be great. I mean, we see a lot of dental assistants in our practice and dentists. Yep. And so, they're very health oriented already. And yeah. uh, so, um, yeah, they're, they're a really good market. I think if you want to market kind of the, the small business and see like three to 10 people, you know, on site, and that would be ideal. I mean, if you saw 10 people on site, you know, you're done for the day, you know, yeah. I mean, in a way, cause, how, Oh, go ahead. How do you, how do you structure payment for that? Does the company pay or each patient pays individually or does it just depend on the situation? It, it just depends on the situation. A lot of times I'll have a house call patient that wants me to meet them at work and mm-hmm. one, one turns into five really quick, you know, um, That's nice. you, know, you know, I'm just sitting there just getting them adjusted and um, you know, some, you know, someone kind of peeks and say, like, Hey, can I get checked out? You know, or, you know, mm-hmm. or can I get adjusted quick if I've already seen them? And then it turns. So then in that case, they're each paying individually. Um, and I found that that works fine because if, if you're at a big, you know, like a, a city bank, you know, there's a lot of red tape bureaucracy, um, uh-huh. you know, with the dentist office. I mean, the, the dentist, you know, the clinic owners making that decision, you know, and uh-huh. they're like, yeah, it's OK. I don't care. Um, mm-hmm. So there, it's an easier, you know, to get in with those companies, I would imagine, than okay. like, uh, you know, um, but then some, I've had a couple of times with the, they've had like an appreciation, you know, event and they wanted me out there and then they just paid the bill. Um, they mm-hmm. just wrote me a check and, um, and I was just going to be there for, you know, four to eight hours and they just, that's, yeah. And we just kind of negotiate that. It's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so it's, it's pretty laid back. Except for everyone's fighting to get to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> What, so what are some office system tools you use to keep overhead low and run more efficiently? Do you have online scheduling, VAs, text reminders, that kind of thing? I did. So I te- so my patients have my cell phone number. So uh-huh. I'll, I'll text them. And again, my day might typically see anywhere from like six to 30 is kind of an anomaly, but like 10 to 12 
pretty average day for me. Um, okay. And uh, so I can keep a lot of that in my head. I just had some continuing ed recently uh, with uh, a HIPAA officer, and I was kind of using a calendar, and I don't know if it was HIPAA compliant, to be honest, because um, I didn't have a business contract with them. You know, like I'm not, it's not an yeah. EHR. So now I'm kind of thinking I need to do something a little different because I don't know if that's totally compliant, keeping it in, on a calendar like that. Um, mm -hmm. but for the most part, my calendar is, it's, it's, I can keep it in my head. It's just back to back to back to back to backs. And I do cluster book. Um, okay. and, uh, or I try to as much as possible. And, um, and so, yeah, so I really don't use too many tools. I mean, I'll text okay. uh, for reminders, you know, just, Hey, just reminding you about an hour before your five o'clock house call this, this evening or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and then my wellness patients, you know, they, they, I schedule them once a month. And then so a day or two before I confirm via text if they want to keep that appointment, if we need to move it back or forward or whatnot. So again, okay. it's, it's embarrassingly low overhead. I don't have any uh, tools helping me run this practice right now. So have you used any tool that didn't work or tried to implement something that hasn't panned out quite right? I did try to do online scheduling and, mm -hmm. um, and I, that's my ideal. I don't personally like talking on the phone. I always feel like I'm getting interrupted. Mm -hmm. um, so I like, I'd rather, I prefer patients would text me and I have that on my website. You can call or text with the hope that they text. Um, yeah. But, uh, and then when I had the online scheduler, it literally was a, you know, they'd go onto the, the calendar online on my website and they would, um, it was synced to my Google calendar and, mm -hmm. um, you know, they won't see what was, what I was doing per se in my calendar. They just saw times were blocked out and they'd pick a time or a date that worked best for them. And I don't know, I, I wish I could market that a little better. I wish people would um, use that. I only had like a handful of people using it every month. Um, mm -hmm. Most people called, especially new ones, um, they didn't use it. I had a handful of new ones use it. Um, but yeah, my idea was like to have something like that. So it's kind of like Lyft or Uber or something like that. And they just mm -hmm. schedule at a time that works best for them. And they have their, you know, their, uh, their, um, address and where I'm meeting them. And then we just go from there. Um, so that would be nice. You need an app. Yeah, no, Maybe. that's what, yeah. And <laughs> I've talked to people about it here. Apps are really expensive to develop. I guess uh -huh. I don't know much about the process. And to be honest, that calendar worked just fine. It's just, it was a matter of getting people to use it. Um, uh, and I don't know how to, you know, I guess I'm not, I guess I wouldn't even know how to promote. You could have a VA that calls them and maybe walks them through the process. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I did something like that one time on my Facebook. I, uh, I had a video, it was kind of a poor quality video and I just walked them through and shared that on my Facebook, but I didn't, I guess I didn't do like a big ad promotion with that or anything either. So oh, that's a good idea. That's a good so, idea. You can use Loom. Loom. Yep. So do you think you'll ever go and have a brick and mortar or maybe invest in a mobile office? Yeah, I've, I've thought about it because the one benefit, well, there's a lot of benefits to brick and mortar or a mobile office, like a running, you know, RV or transit mm -hmm. uh, is that your environment is always the same. Uh, so you kind of have this consistency and when patients are coming in, they're coming in the, under your turf, you know, so you kind of yeah. have this, you know, this process. And uh, so when you're going into a house, it's always different and you're always got to set up and, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's that. Um, so I've thought about, you know, maybe at some point, you know, if I really got where I was working with businesses specifically, like, you know, more than five to seven a week, I think, um, that I would consider like just building up a unit. There's a guy on our, a couple guys on our forum, that, uh, you know, that's what they do. They, you know, Dr. Jeff Solomon out of Miami, I think, you know, that's what he's been doing for years and you pull up to I in the parking lot. Yep. Mm -hmm. You, uh, pull up into the company park. Now he works with some big companies and you pull up in their parking lot and they just come out and, uh, they come in. I mean, it's really a mobile unit is not, it's really not any different than a brick and mortar. It's just, they're coming onto you. So all the liability isn't on the company. They're literally coming into your clinic. Um, so yeah, it probably would be a nice thing. And it's a giant billboard. I mean, people see that. Yeah. I mean, rolling around town, I mean, it's, it gets attention. So 
Yeah, no, I would consider it at some point. I like what I do right now because, um, especially now it's springtime here in South Dakota, you know, I get to be outside. I get to, you know, yeah. some people like to just get adjusted out on their deck or outside in, you know, in the front yard or whatever. So, or in like in the driveway <laughs> in the garage. Um, so it's, you know, I, that's the one thing I do like about house calls is I'm not kind of confined to an office. If I have a gap in my practice, you know, that day, you know, a couple hours yeah. and I might get, a, I might get a workout in or, you know, mow, mow my lawn or, you know, just kind of hang out. Um, as opposed to I have to be in the office cause you know, we, we do take walk-ins or someone could call or whatever. So, uh, huh. but you'd keep it mobile. You like I that? Th- I think I would because, you know, there's probably about, I feel like there's like 170 chiropractors just in my town um, uh-huh. of 180,000 people. On it. Those are licensed chiropractors, not necessarily separate businesses. And from my perspective, I know we all do different things. You know, we know there's over a hundred different techniques. Um, but from, I think the population's perspective, we probably all do kind of the same thing. And what's to distinguish chiropractor A on the street across from chiropractor B on the street? You know, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, with house calls and having, you know, extended hours and being mobile, um, it really, you know, <laughs> people, they kind of take notice and they, they're like, wait, I've never heard of that. You know, so it keeps me, it's my unique yeah. selling proposition, you know? So yeah, I don't, that's I don't, what been yeah. Yeah. So, and so, yeah, with, oh, go ahead. What? No, you go ahead. Oh, so like, I mean you know, when you go into an office, there might, unless you hear, you know, they have such a great reputation, maybe that's their USP. Um, you don't really know what the difference between them until you go in to a chiropractor and then maybe go to another one for a second opinion. Then you find out, you know, what's different between the two. Um, Mm -hmm. but with house calls and call and texting for appointments and being available, um, that's really obvious to people and that's unique Uh in my town at least. So Cool. So in terms of success in business, what do you see that separates the very successful doctors from those that are struggling? Um, I think the, I think it is, you really have to get good at marketing and getting new patients. Um, uh, if you can, I mean, you could be, it's, I hate to say it, you could be not that great of a chiropractor and just have a flood of new patients coming in every month. And you can be successful. Um, and, uh, and that's just because chiropractic is so powerful. I mean, you could do flying seven on a lot of people and probably help 60, 70% of the population, to be honest. Um, and uh, uh, so I think what holds people back is they just got to they gotta be willing to market. They got to be willing to listen to what their market is telling them and not you know, get obsessed. I've been guilty of this. You go on some of these Facebook groups and you're, you're hearing contradictory uh, information from, you know, people that seem like they know what they're talking about. They probably do, but from their own perspective. Um, and so pick one guru or so to speak and uh, learn how to market. The first three to five years of a business is all about customer or new patient acquisition. Um, it's not about branding and, and whatnot. That's, you need to have that. But, uh, most businesses fail because it's not because they had a bad idea or they're, you know, it was a horrible business model. It was, they just didn't get enough customers and they need to yeah. focus on that the first three to five years. So that's what I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They have to be really invested in it and yeah. building it. Yeah. Yep. And keep that momentum. I think uh, you have, you know, maybe a flood come in once and you get, you, you just think that's going to always happen, but really yep. you need to you keep that momentum and you keep, networking and keep yep. marketing and keep building it. So. Yeah, you, yep. You, and it's, it's practices three things in my opinion. It is new patients, it's retention and it's pricing, right? Um, mm-hmm. You can't really have retention if you're not getting patients. So you have to get the patients first. You got to get the, the floodgates opened and then you got to learn once you're maybe you're getting busy and, but they keep going out, you know, it's a revolving door. Then you got to work on your retention, whatever that means mm-hmm. for your philosophy. And then, and then from there, you kind of figure out the prices. I talked the other day to someone um, about, they think, you know, they want to double their practice or, you know, really expand. And they think, well, I need to see like 50 new patients a month and I'm seeing only 10, you know. Um, and it's not, it's not like that at all. You only have to increase 
each metric, the new patients, the uh, pricing and the um, retention by 30% and you can double your practice. So instead of Mm -hmm. seeing 10 new patients a month for $100 a visit on average for 10 visits, which is 10,000 a month, just increase it to 13 a month uh, for 13 visits to maybe 130 and there's $21,000. You doubled your practice and you didn't really increase the metrics significantly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. What about some advice for new docs that are interested in starting a house call chiropractic business? Well, first thing I would do is call your malpractice, see what they think of it. That's what I did. They didn't, they didn't seem to have a problem. Um, and then, um, and then from there, um, if they're thinking about starting a house call practice, you know, you got to have the basic stuff, um, you know, your table, your, if you're going to use an EHR, um, you know, vehicle, um, and then figure out how you're going to market it. And then, um, it's really, it really, I don't think it's really any different than any other businesses, just getting new, new customers. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, what I, that's what I would tell them is, you know, make sure all the legal stuff is, you know, set with your, you know, your local ordinances and your, your board and your malpractice, and then go forth from there and, you know, figure out who your avatar is, figure out your message, and then go talk to those people and try to schedule, you know, your first, you know, 10 to 20 house calls that month. Mm-hmm. And they should definitely join your Facebook group. Yeah, right? yeah, definitely. That group, I st- it's a great group. I like it. Yeah, I mean, I, I started it, to be honest, to get free advice. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and you know, you know, as chiropractors, we tend to get on an island by ourselves during the year unless we go to a lot of, you know, um, you know, like continuing ed or, um, you know, uh, practice management groups or something. Um, and especially with house calls, I mean, I felt like I'm pretty sure I am the only house call chiropractor in South Dakota, um, exclusively house call, not saying I'm the first one to ever do a house call. Um, but, um, and, uh, so you kind of get on an Island. So I thought I don't, I knew a couple other people, and, uh, that were doing it around the country just cause I found them on, you know, social media. And, uh-huh. uh, and I, so we we're a friend of them on Facebook and we was like, Hey, I'm going to start a group. So I'm going to add you on this. And then it just kind of blossomed from there. So, and what's the name of it for those it's, that want to find it? It's house call chiropractors forum. It's very boring. I wanted, I was thinking, I was thinking in search engine optimization, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a horrible name, but it definitely gets the point across. Well, I found it. So yeah. So, do you have any daily rituals, habits, or anything that you do each day to kind of get in the get ready to go? Yeah, I mean, I always wake up and do cardio in the morning. I just like to, um, just kind of wakes me up, get some coffee in me, um, kind of do my affirmations, you know, that kind of deal. Um, visualization. It's, I mean, it's not really a big deal. It's just kind of, I think about what I want to, my goals and whatnot for the month or the year and, um, write out my affirmations. That's something I got from that, um, practice that I was associating down in Texas as we wrote those out every day. Um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and then I just go into it and then it's really fun actually. I mean, um, um, just seeing, you know, having a full schedule, um, and just helping people, and doing house calls. And at the end of the day, you know, feeling like you helped a lot of people. It's really great. Cool. Do you have a favorite book that you could recommend? I, so I read a lot. Um, and, uh, my current author that I'm really like, I, I bought several of his books is, um, his name's Ryan holiday and he's, he's not a, a chiropractic marketer, but he's just like, he, he sells for big companies but the concepts are there. And the newest book that I read from him was perennial seller. And Mm -hmm. I guess maybe a follow up to that book would be, um, I think it's called growth hacking, growth hacker marketing, which I thought was, and it's, uh, basically it's, it just kind of, it takes a, you know, the young tech startup way of marketing a business without any, you know, the traditional background in marketing, you know, you know, so basically the whole concept is you should build marketing into your product or service, right? Mm-hmm. Instead of, you know, building it and then sending it off to a marketing crew that has to market it, 
It's like, no, it should mm-hmm. be, you know, it should be priced appropriately. So it goes viral. Like people are like, wow, I can't believe this is that. Or you like, you have to have a great referral program or just a great service that it just speaks for itself. Right. So that's the first thing in, you know, concept in the, in those books. Mm-hmm. And I think awesome. mobile but house calls out. definitely speak for itself. Uh huh. So I'll have to check it out. I know I've heard of that second one. Yep. Yeah. It's a really good, but it's a short read. I mean, it's only like 50, 60 pages. Eh? It's not very long. It's very small. You could write, read it and, you know, probably, right, sure. probably about an hour to be honest. Okay. What's the best business advice you've ever received? Um, let's see here. I think the best business advice is, um, I heard it from, he was a practice consultant, uh, that, uh, my boss worked with when I was down in Texas. Mm-hmm. And he said, there's two things. It's value service at a fair price. So it's both. You need an attractive price at a great, and a great service. So the two. Okay, wait, what was that again? Cause I think it might've cut out. Okay. So value is quality service at a fair price. So you need an attractive price and a great service. And mm-hmm. the two aren't mutually exclusive. Um, so, and that's it really, when you get your pricing right, and I get why chiropractors get so on our forum, I don't know if you've seen it, pricing comes up quite a bit. It's really important and you have to get that right. Um, and whatever that is for you. Um, and then the other one was from, uh, Chris Dell. Uh, he's a, he's, he's a marketing guy and he works with, you know, big companies and he's kind of a designer in terms of like, um, website and logo design, but they work with like big companies. And I mean, I heard him say marketing is where the real work begins, right? Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to get the patients in or the clients in and you do what you do. You should know what you do and you should always develop and cultivate your skill set. But ultimately, I mean, if you want to build a successful practice, I think it comes down to learning how to market and retain. Mm-hmm. So those are, those are some of the pieces of advice that I learned and I take to heart. I mean, those quotes are kind of pinned up in my home office, you know, on the wall. And, uh, and there's a lot of stuff that I could go on and on about business with, but those are the big ones. Nice. I like it. Did you, um, or what's the best way for people to connect with you? They can, they can, a lot of people private message me on Facebook. If they see me on the, the, um, you know, the, the house call forum, you can private message me. Um, that's usually where people connect with me. And then if we want to talk on the phone, they can give me a call. Um, that's mostly how people connect with me. I haven't had too many people email me or anything like that. I mean, even you connected me with me through messenger, I think. So I did. And I try to get, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm a millennial. So I, I have my phone on me all the time. I'm going to answer it. So, <laughs> okay. Well, we have the link. We'll have the links on our website and okay. I appreciate your time.